All right, good morning, Waltham. How are you guys doing today? I got a room full of decaf drinkers. That's incredibly exciting to me. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Constant Contact for inviting me out here. Um, I'd hate to ever be the guy who has to follow Michael Lopp on a conference lineup. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, that aside, it is really great to be here and uh, to be part of this amazing event. Um, so my name is Ethan Marcotte. I'm a local designer based here in Cambridge, more specifically. I'm Beep on Twitter. If you follow me there, I apologize profusely. Um, but I actually have a confession to make to you guys. And uh, I feel I can do that. You know, we, I've been in this room for all of 10 seconds. I feel like I know you. <laughs> I am an incredibly, impossibly lazy person. I'll get to that in a minute. Because what I'd actually like to do first is tell you a quick story about a tree. Now, this tree is located in the Pando Forest. Now, Pando is actually located in Utah. It's part of the Fish Lake National Reserve. And it's some uh, 106 acres in size. It's a fairly good-sized forest. So as you're walking through Pando, you're surrounded by these, these beautiful white trunks shooting up out of the ground. And there are some, some 40,000 or so estimated to be in Pando. But as you're looking through this tree, it becomes appear, apparent to you after a few minutes that I've actually lied to you. Because Pando isn't actually a forest. It's just one single tree. You see, Pando is the Latin term for I spread. And Pando is not a forest, but rather it's a, a giant clonal colony of one single quaking aspen tree. So all of those 40,000 trunks that you see are actually just stems, all shooting out of this massive underground root system that they all share, which I think is kind of beautiful. And Pando's age is actually estimated to be some 80,000 years old, although there are some scientists who may be credible, I have no idea, um, that say its age is actually closer to one million years. But regardless of which side of the debate you fall on, Pando is both the oldest and the largest known organism on the planet. This is a talk about web design, I promise. Um, <laughs> The reason I love this story so much, though, is because I think in recent years, we've started to see web design's forest for its trees. We've moved further and further away from this old, outdated view of a page, right? This sort of like abstract system of columns and rows that we sort of stuff with content. And we understand more that when we're building our interfaces, when we're designing our products, our work begins a level beneath that on the individual components and pieces of our design. There's this one um, amazing essay by a friend of mine, Trent Walton, who wrote about his transition from someone who's kind of a, a responsive design skeptic into somebody who's doing some of the best responsive design work out there today. And he talks about how he traded the control he had in Photoshop for a new kind of control. And I think it's interesting to point out that he doesn't say less control, but a new kind. You know, one that uses flexible grids, flexible images, and media queries to build not a page, but a network of content that can be rearranged at any screen size to best convey a message. And I think there's something really kind of poetic about that image, right? You know, and, you know, that we've really just sort of moved away from this notion that there's sort of like an ideal canonical view of our design. And as we move further and further beyond the desktop, we are really designing these networks of content that can be built from the ground up. And so to do so, we need to understand the characteristics of these individual pieces of our design and then basically turn them into that network that can be rearranged at any screen size to best convey a message. And I have another confession to make. It feels incredibly weird to be the guy talking about responsive design, even though I wrote the first article, because I, I, I met a publishing deadline. And I wasn't expecting anything like the reception that it got. You know, to see basically every single industry get incredibly excited about the flexibility at the heart of responsive design, or more specifically, the, heart, uh, the flexibility at the heart of the web, and use that network of content idea to basically rearrange their interfaces, rearrange their content, to think about how they can tell stories, how they can communicate to their audiences regardless of the size of their screen, whether it's incredibly wide or incredibly small. And once they start using those ingredients of a responsive design, fluid grids and media queries, then they basically understand those, those technical constraints are really sort of the easy ones to figure out. You know, the bigger problems start to come into workflow, you know, how we collaborate together, how we think about designing these hierarchies. Now, that's not to say that responsive design's, you know, the answer for every prob problem in the digital world, but, like, it's another tool in the box. And I think it helps us tell some of these stories when we're dealing with all of these challenges. Because, you know, I mean, I think it's fairly safe to say that, you know, just working online, we have a fairly tough job. 
And it's not remotely the toughest job in the world. I'm not even going to pretend that. But, you know, we have our challenges, right? And they, they seem to be compounding themselves. You know, it's not even just about individual device classes anymore. We're being asked to design compelling digital experiences for more operating systems than at any point in the web's very short history. We're dealing with more input modes than we ever had to think about previously, and devices that can't neatly be siloed into touch or analog, but some of them sort of you know, straddle the two really effectively and well. We're dealing with more displays of varying color density and degree. In other words, we're basically at this point now where the words that we use to refer to these devices most broadly, tablet and mobile, are so broad and just so useless, right? I mean, they're so inexact in trying to address the challenges of what we're trying to build and design and publish on a daily basis. And I think Google Glass is probably in there somewhere, too. I don't know. But, <laughs> all right, but you know, putting all that aside for just a second, I mean, these challenges, I mean, it's, it's not like they're going down at any point, right? I mean, there are these new browsing contexts and new device classes hitting the market. We just saw a couple new ones hit uh, you know, just a few days ago from Apple's keynote. Um, hardware and software vendors are experimenting with new interaction models that we weren't thinking about when we were designing our products and designing our interfaces. And the web that we use to publish our content, that our audiences use to reach our sites and services, is far more broadly accessed today than at any point in its very short history, but it's also far more fragile and far more volatile than we might like to think about when we're starting to have these conversations about what our sites and services need to build and what they need to be. So when I'm looking at you know, the fragility of the network and all these new interaction models and these new device classes that are hitting the market, I'd like to say that I rise to the occasion every single day, you know, and I don't pry myself to sleep at night. But more often than not, you know, I'll be totally honest with you guys, my reaction tends to be one of, well, frankly, laziness. I get a little bit negative. I get a little bit tired. And frankly, most days I just want to go back to directly to bed. Always leave with a gif, Mom said. She didn't actually say that, but um, I like to pretend that she did. But the, the, here's the thing about laziness, right? I mean, we use a lot of language in our daily work, right? I mean, we, you know, I could be talking to you, and we could be talking about a mutual friend of ours, and I could describe her as liberal or conservative, as uh, logical or a real daydreamer. And depending on who you are and the values that you hold dear, either one of those words would be seen as either a compliment or a complaint, Laziness doesn't really have that problem, though. Everyone just sort of regards it as just like an awful, terrible thing, right? It's just some, something that's preventing you from being a better version of yourself, from building a better product, for getting to that next level of professionalism. And I'm here to suggest today that maybe the picture's a little bit more complicated than that. Maybe laziness is what we need to deal with some of the complexity that we're dealing with in the marketplace right now. There's this one great quote by Khalil Gibran, who basically said that our anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but from wanting to control it. And I know at least for me, and maybe I'm just the lone person in the room here, but, you know, it's, that's definitely true. You know, I look at all these challenges, new device classes, you know, and a very volatile network, and I just sort of see them as something that I need to meet head on, that I need to have a solution ready at hand to sort of design a better uh, solution, to design a better interface, to basically answer that question. And I'm wondering if maybe that's the wrong approach. And in fact, maybe a little bit of laziness applied intelligently to web design could actually maybe be a little bit of a virtue. Because maybe it's about letting go, relinquishing that need to control the experience perfectly, and maybe just provide some rough parameters for shaping it as it's being experienced in all these thousands upon millions of devices that our users are accessing our work with. So anyway, this is a kind of an open ramble about how laziness, as I've seen it, has been kind of manifesting itself in my work. And to do so, I thought I'd actually walk through a couple different specific components of responsive design to sort of tell you how I think about maybe letting go a little bit more, but maybe also being able to do a little bit more in the same result. So with that, let's get started right with layout. Now, at least for me, laziness in responsive design has been kind of manifesting itself in two aspects of my work specifically dealing with video and other kinds of embedded media in a responsive design, and then actually designing the grids that kind of house the content, that sort of power the interfaces that I'm working on. So starting right with media, there's been an incredible amount of writing about you know, responsive images and working with fixed mi- with media in a flexible layout, right? And there's a significant amount of work that goes into that, but this is kind of the first step in the journey, this one simple line of CSS. And all that it says, basically, is that if you have an image in a completely flexible layout, its width will never exceed the width of its containing element. 
its maximum width will never be greater than 100%. And it'll sort of have this really neat sort of shrink wrap effect as it resizes proportionally. I mention that because the nice thing about this approach is it can be extended to include other kinds of media as well, like embedded objects and embedded video. So here's a quick example from my blog, um, which is neither responsive or attractive, let's be perfectly honest here. But um, you'll notice that I'm using the same CSS rule, and because of the flexible layout and because of that max width 100% rule, the video always sort of hews to the width of that completely flexible container. It never bleeds out, breaking the layout. Um, now, this is obviously not optimal because, I mean, the height of the video hasn't changed, and this is really a problem of scale because the video that we put into our pages doesn't actually have any intrinsic dimensions like it, images do. So we have to specify them in the document. We have to actually manually write them out into HTML because it's 2014 and we all love doing that. Um, but we can override the width pretty easily with the CSS as we just did. But we can't do the same thing with the height. We can't set it to height auto or something like that you know, because basically we'd have a whole bunch of zero height videos on our pages and I would probably be fired. So a lot of people are really kind of experimenting with this and trying to puzzle their way out of this problem. And they're doing so in a responsive context. So this is madebyhand.com. And this is a beautiful responsive site uh, featuring a beautiful film series. Even if you're not interested in responsive design, I can't recommend this enough. It's a very short film series featuring some short films about makers and designers in Brooklyn. But because it's a responsive design, you can watch these films on their website. And regardless of the size of their screen, those videos resize proportionally. And the reason they're able to do that is because they do a little bit of light JavaScript work to measure the video's dimensions when the page first loads. And then any time the page resizes itself or you change the orientation of your device, it basically just redraws the video using those same dimensions but resizing them according to that first measurement. This is an early version of the Do Lecture site, a conference series, and they basically took the same approach. A little light JavaScript, measure the video, and then redraw it proportionally. Now, you'll notice in both of these instances, though, there's a little bit of a slight visual stutter. You know, while it takes a second for the video to kind of catch up with the design as it's resized. Now, this is because, you know, the resize event in JavaScript is incredibly expensive to sample. So it's good to throttle it a little bit. But the challenge is, you know, this kind of points to the fact that maybe JavaScript's not the best approach to this. Maybe we need sort of a CSS native solution to kind of, you know, do the heavy lifting for us. Well, thankfully, because we are living in the future, this was solved about five years ago for us um, in an article for Alista Park called uh, Creating Intrinsic Ratios for Video. And this guy, Terry Koblenz, came up with this really uh, amazing approach to coming up with proportionally resizing media in fluid layouts. And his approach was actually, I, I think, kind of brilliant because what he did was he basically looked at videos in pages. And we understand that they have certain characteristics, right? The immediate ones are sort of a width and a height expressed in pixels. But if we put the pixels aside for just one minute, those two characteristics, width and height, actually have a very deep and profound relationship to each other, specifically the aspect ratio, you know, measured from one corner of the video down to its opposite on the other corner. And we can calculate that aspect ratio by taking the height of the video and dividing it against its width. And so if we basically plug those pixels into the formula, we're left with a, uh, an aspect ratio of about 56.25% or 16 by 9 in cinema terms, if there are any uh, you know, film geeks in the house. Anyone? Anyone? Just me? OK, all right. In the back, fantastic. So what we can do, we're just going to sort of put that number in the back burner for a second. We can go back to our video as it's expressed in the markup. And maybe we're going to size it down to be accessible to small screens by default. It's that sort of mobile-first thinking. But regardless of that, you're going to sort of wrap it in some sort of containing element. I've just used a simple div with a class of video box. And so with that in place, we can then go into our style sheet, and we can take that aspect ratio we calculated and apply it as a padding top to the top of that containing element around our video. So what that does is it creates a kind of ghost box at the top of that container, a padding top that's always going to be 56.25% as tall as the box is wide. I barely understand math, so I actually had to do a quick demo to sort of figure out how this works. So I went back to the Do Lecture site, and I kind of rooted around in my browser, Inspector, I deleted the video entirely, and I applied this lovely pink background that I spent minutes on. Um, in fact, the tool you see is actually generated with CSS, so for all intents and purposes, this is a completely empty block in the HTML. And so now, though, when I resize the browser, you're going to notice that it's so much smoother, and that completely empty block actually maintains an aspect ratio, even though there's no content whatsoever in here. I think this is very neat, but this is also why I don't go out very much. Um, <laughs> I'm so lonely, guys. Uh, 
But anyway, this is just our foundation, right? This is just the stage on which we can set our video. So what we can then do is go back to the CSS, and because we set a, a position relative on the container, we now have a position in context isolated within that block. So we can just use simple absolute positioning to take that video, anchor it top left in the, in the container, and then set its width and height to be 100% of the width and height of that containing element, which has its own unique aspect ratio. So I went back to my browser, and I basically deleted all the JavaScript entirely. And you'll see that the result is so much smoother. We have some lightweight CSS that basically has an aspect ratio aware stage on which we're then sort of stretching our video out. It's a little bit less complexity. It's a little bit less JavaScript to basically achieve the same result. And it's actually much more resilient and much more bulletproof. So anyway, this is kind of a simple example of what I think of when I'm talking about laziness and responsive design. It's basically like, rather than immediately defaulting to adding another layer of complexity, maybe there's another approach. Maybe there's another solution to that problem that we can sort of explore. And this has been sort of informing a lot of the work that I do on the grid level as well, you know, sort of on the macro level of layout, my responsive designs. A quick example would be from editorially. This is a, a web application that I worked on a couple years ago with some friends of mine. And sadly, they shuttered their doors um, earlier this year, but uh, it's kind of emblematic of what uh, this laziness and layout kind of means for me. So there's this dashboard-based view where writers and editors can kind of come together and work on these documents. And this dashboard is basically built with a fluid grid that uses a very simple formula to translate these target pixel widths that were designed in something like Photoshop and express them in relative terms proportional to their context or to their containing element in the design. And basically, once you have those two uh, pixel-based numbers, you can plug them into this formula to perceive a, uh, a percentage-based result that will make you claw your eyes because it's incredibly unsexy. But basically, that's the fundamental relationship between that element and its container. And you've now turned it into a flexible element in your design. And we can apply this to other elements, like the gutters that separate parts of our grid as well. Those are target pixel widths that can be expressed in relationship to the same containing element. And we're basically left with, again, another incredibly unsexy looking percentage. But what we can do is rather than rounding those numbers off, we can just drop them directly into our CSS and let the browser do the internal rounding for us. Target divided by context equals result. So this is the foundation for a flexible grid, but there's always cleanup that needs to happen. And as I've been doing more responsive layouts with more complex interfaces, I've been learning to lean on tools like EnthChild that allow me to sort of step back from kind of like um, muddying my markup up with a bunch of presentational classes and instead directly address specific parts of my document in a more flexible fashion right from my CSS. So the way EnthChild work is basically if I wanted to address a specific part of my design, I could say document cell EnthChild2 to basically apply cells, uh, styles, excuse me, to the second cell in that uh, grid just immediately. That probably has very limited utility, but where nth child gets really interesting is when you say something like nth child 2n. Now, the reason this is neat is because 2n basically allows me to immediately address some styles to every even-numbered cell in this document. So whether there are 20 cells or 2,000, every even-numbered one is going to have those styles applied to it. Now, the reason this works is because n is a counter. It starts from 0 and increments by 1 each time, so then it's just simple multiplication. 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, and so on and so forth, basically into infinity, regardless of the size of this HTML page. So anyway, for this particular layout, this three-column view, what I can then do is say something like nth child 3n to basically remove the right-hand margin from those third cells and basically ensure that those, every third cell is flush against the right-hand edge of the design. And I can also say 3n plus 1 to remove the floats, to clear the floats basically on every third cell, but this time starting from 1, rather than zero, to ensure that every three, uh, every three cells basically forms a nice discrete row of my grid to build a three-column layout. Now, uh, this is an incredibly flexible approach. It doesn't work well in certain older versions of certain browsers, like <coughs> Internet Explorer. <laughs> Sorry, just, I, I never studied theater. Um, but anyway, uh, the nice thing about this is that you can apply some fallback styles, so they still get a completely flexible layout, even though it might not be as visually... Um, rigorous or pretty, um, but regardless of how you manage that, it's just some simple proportional math and a couple lines of nth child driven CSS to build a completely flexible layout without actually having to munch the markup to sort of describe the layout in detail at the HTML level. You can sort of bring it up a layer to lighten your document. Where this gets really interesting, though, is when you actually bring media queries into the mix. Now, every responsive design that I've started with you know, begins with this sort of baseline design that's small screen friendly by, uh, by default. Uh, 
There aren't really any layout rules outside of the media queries. It's just one small screen friendly layout of tasks listed from top to bottom of the document. But then as the viewport gets a little bit wider, we can look for areas to enhance the design with media queries. So for example, as I bro broaden things up a little bit more, I can move to a two column layout at around 31 M's using nth child, nth child 2n and 2n plus 1. And then as things get a little bit wider still, I can maybe sort of fast the markup a little bit in the masthead or the layout of the masthead when I have a little bit more room, and then move to a three column layout in the body using 3n and 3n plus 1. And so I think you can see sort of where this is going, right? I mean, without actually having to sort of describe the layout in my HTML at all, I can basically then move to a four column layout at around uh, 80 M's, you know, using 4n and 4n plus 1. The benefit to letting go of describing the layout in great detail in your HTML is that you know, we're at a point now with the tools that we have in CSS where we can build grid systems that are effectively infinite. Right? I mean, responsive design isn't about taking a desktop-specific design and sort of sizing it down to smaller screens, although that's definitely a nice benefit. We can basically build a design that doesn't really have an ideal state. It can exist across a potentially infinite resolution spectrum, which is kind of terrifying, but also kind of amazing what we can do when we learn to let go of that control at the document level, and we move it up just a little bit. Which maybe means that this is an ideal time to talk about the F word, more specifically, frameworks. Um, now, just to be very clear, I mean, I think that these off-the-shelf CSS and HTML frameworks that allow us to build layouts very quickly have incredible utility. I mean, for people that are just learning about page layout, whether it's responsive or not, for people that are working in large teams, this takes an incredible amount of ambiguity out of the design process. Um, but to be clear, I think that these are incredibly heavy frameworks. And I don't just mean from a code standpoint. I mean the, the extra HTML that goes into describing these layouts, that, although that could definitely be a concern. I mean they're kind of conceptually heavy, right? I mean they're still very much tied to this idea of a page, that there's somehow this ideal canonical view of our interfaces. And then in the document, we're sort of like describing how they need to adapt at certain points. And we're always sort of working off this ideal 12 or 16 column grid and then dividing it by three or by four to make it accessible to smaller screens. And again, there are benefits there, but I wonder if it's not maybe the best solution for the, some of the challenges we're going to be facing in the near term. I've been doing a lot of reading recently about the early days of modern animation, actually, um, you know, where we had folks like Windsor McKay and Max Fleischer, basically, who were really at the forefront of trying to figure out what this medium could be, what it could do. They were really among the first people to put pen to paper and then make these drawings move. So they should be commended for their work, and they did beautiful, beautiful things, but I think it's also fair to point out that they very much feel of their time, right? I mean, they, they almost feel mechanical. It's hard to sort of connect with the work that they're doing. Now, this is because they had a tough job. Like I said, I mean, they didn't have the benefit of, you know, talking at conferences about the best practices in page layout, blah. But it's really about, like, you know, they were, they were really at the forefront. The, they were pioneering in trying to figure out what they could do. But it wasn't until a few decades later that you know, Walt Disney founded his studios that people actually took animation seriously as an art form. You know, building on the work of people that went be, uh, behind him, um, Disney and his team took these incredibly spare but expressive drawings. And it's really hard to overstate the effect that they had on audiences at the time. Because once these very simple looking drawings were colored and animated, they felt real. They had this emotional quality on top of the motion that they possessed. There's this uh, line that I love by Mark Davis, who was one of the early employees at Disney Studios, who said that animation had been done before, but stories had never been told before Disney founded his studio, which I'm pretty sure is the 1940s equivalent of a mic drop and then walking out of the room. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, he has a point, right? I mean, because Disney's work as a studio wasn't technically more impressive than his competitors. Far from it, in fact. In a lot of ways, it was actually a lot more elementary, a lot more fundamental. But when those characters came to life, when they moved from one end of the frame to the other, they felt real, and they felt human. And this wasn't because Disney himself was an incredibly talented animator or illustrator. In fact, he was neither of those things. But he's an incredibly exacting director. And he's actually cited by a lot of his employees at this time as basically demanding of his staff drawings that possessed a caricature of realism, an illusion of life, which I think is a beautiful line. Um, you know, from Disney for all of his faults. I mean, that's really kind of poetic. In fact, there's this wonderful book that I'd highly recommend reading called The Illusion of Life, which was written by two of Disney's original animators, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. And in it, they basically tried to distill what it was that worked about Disney's formula. 
And it be, went beyond the technical, right? I mean, it wasn't just about process or how they executed on these drawings, but really it was about these principles that they all used to talk about the quality of their work. Now, I don't have audio, so I can't really play this video in great detail, but these 12 basic principles of animation were incredibly powerful. Um, I'd recommend checking this out at some point. Because the nice thing about each one of these principles is that it was basically shared vocabulary. So as the animators were sort of reviewing some work on a feature film that they were working on, they could basically ask themselves if a character had enough squash and stretch as it moved from one corner of the frame to the other. Or did a character's arm properly uh, anticipate the action that was about to happen when they were about to throw a ball from one person to another? In other words, this is a framework, but not in a web prescriptive sense of the word, where they're thinking about a checklist of terms that need to be hit to actually you know, produce quality work. But it was basically a vocabulary that they could all share, you know, a philosophical framework, one that's so much more lightweight than I think we currently have on the web. And I wonder if we might be able to do the same thing. You know, can we have a framework that's less focused on how we execute and talk a little bit more about the quality of the work that we're doing, especially as we're thinking about adapting our work to different media and to different interfaces? Because it's absolutely true, we have a lot of challenges working on the web, thinking about how we need to adapt to different inter interaction models and different device classes. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we think the web is the first place that's had to deal with this. Print designers have been dealing with this for years. Uh, last year, the Whitney Museum actually just rebranded, and they came up with this beautiful, minimalist, arcing logo of the new responsive W that they called it. And then they went on for like five paragraphs to say this had nothing whatsoever to do with responsive web design. That was some weird geek thing. But... Um, <laughs> You know, it's this incredibly evocative thing, as simple as it seems, but it's also infinitely flexible. You know, it can incorporate other pieces of artwork from upcoming exhibitions at the museum. It can also be encountered at various physical locations in the user's day. So as you're looking at all these dozens or maybe hundreds or even thousands of different applications of this one flexible logo, I, I, you'd probably be forgiven for thinking that there's some, like, computer bleeping away in a broom closet somewhere with some incredibly complex algorithm, you know, producing all these pieces of work. But they actually came up with a very simple framework for designing this very flexible logo. The designers basically then went on to say that given any fixed piece of paper, there were probably certain elements that had to be incorporated that the logo had to encompass, basically. So given the available remaining space, it was just a simple matter of dividing that open space into four equal quadrants. And then it's just a matter of connecting the dots. Top left to bottom right, bottom left to top right. It's almost elegant, right? As simplistic as it is, but they went on to iterate over this to create millions of different interfaces for this one simple brand. This is not a new problem. Carl Gerstner, who was a Swiss designer in the middle of the 20th century, spent a considerable amount of time talking about this very specific problem. And his solution wasn't to think about the constraints of the page that he was going to be printing on, but rather to build frameworks that could do that work for him. And he has this one wonderful quote that said, instead of solutions for problems, we should be looking for systems that support solutions. For no problem is there an absolute or perfect solution. And there is always a group of solutions, one of which is the best under certain conditions. So in other words, moving beyond these sort of off-the-shelf frameworks that do this thinking for us, we should develop a vocabulary maybe to talk about how and why we need to be building you know, more flexibly and how these interfaces need to adapt in a more responsive manner. And this conversation's already been starting, which I think is incredibly exciting to see. Um, Nathan Ford wrote this article for a list of parts some time ago talking about you know, not just why and how our, our designs could adapt, but you know, also what constituted a well-formed graphic design. Well, that's very exciting. The three words you least like to see is keynote quit unexpectedly. the best and worst part of my day. Keynote. Um, so what's been really nice to see about that is, um, you know, he started to have this conversation about basically um, moving past this notion of like these fixed and flexible, you know, 12 or 16 column grids that are incredibly rigid and very regular. And instead basically moving into something that might be a little bit more ratio driven, right, that has its own sense of rhythm and its own sense of pace. So basically moving away from this 12-column notion to something that actually feels movement from one end of the viewport to the other. But what I really liked about Nathan's article was this focus on articulating how and when these more content-driven approaches to responsive design need to adapt. And to do so, he actually borrowed a lot of uh, language from graphic design, right? Looking for areas where the design starts to lose integrity. For example, sevens might start to manifest where these, there are these unsightly gaps that appear beneath key elements. <laughs> 
or maybe drifts that appear where elements start to become uh, a little bit removed from their related content, where the association starts to get lost, or where pinches start to occur, which is kind of the inverse, where elements start to collide with each other to create a kind of a confusing hierarchy. These are the kinds of frameworks that we need as we're talking about designing these interfaces that aren't just for tablet, mobile, and desktop, but that really are prepared and ready for the designs that we don't necessarily have and the devices that we don't have on hand for the next few years. In other words, making our designs fit to the devices we have today is kind of the baseline. It's kind of table stakes, really. And we need to be looking for ways to articulate how our designs need to feel at home, regardless of the size of the display, regardless of the interaction model that, ha that happens. And so for me, more and more, it's been getting back to this old idea of this network of content, right? Moving past this notion of a page and designing these small little interface pockets, basically, these small layout systems that can basically be rearranged at any screen size to best convey a message. Now, each one of these little layout systems are effectively self-contained, right? They have their own rules and their own needs, kind of independent of everything around them, but they're also loosely bound to and aware of the other elements on the page as well. As a quick example, you know, here's a masthead. I just took this from editorially. You know, so this is a layout system that has its own adaptation design, uh, requirements, and it looks like a fairly traditional toolbar until you fall below a certain point, at which point it dramatically simplifies itself. It's the same content, it's the same inter, uh, information, but basically the interaction has changed a little bit. So instead of pull-out menus, it's basically takeover panels that might you know, sort of completely overlay the, uh, the editing experience. But in terms of how we were building this, it was basically a matter of sort of sorting this into a couple of discrete buckets that we could sort of move around the design as it adapted, right? So we started from this simplistic view, and then basically once we had this in place, we could use simple absolute positioning in our CSS to take those, those five or six tasks on the toolbar and above a certain breakpoint, just basically shunt them off to the left or the right-hand side when we had a little bit more space. But it's not just about jockeying elements around once we can do so. It's really about taking advantage of the space available to you at any point in the resolution spectrum, large or small. You know, so, for example, we could look for opportunities to promote elements out of submenus by default and position them up in the center of the toolbar to make them a little bit more prominent, to make better use of that space. Now, the other question that I often get when people are looking at my CSS um, in addition to why God did you do that, you're terrible at everything, um, is really, you know, it's like, where do these breakpoints come from? Why 50 M's? Well, that's really driven by the needs of the content within this one particular layout system. Because below that 50 M threshold, that central piece of text you see in the toolbar starts to get clipped by the buttons on the left and the right. So that makes a natural threshold for us to sort of maintain that simplified view of the design until we get above that. In other words, use media queries not to basically make your designs fit on specific screen resolutions, but to defend the integrity of your content. You know, looking at the needs of those small layout systems and thinking about what's going to make them most pleasurable to read and interact with as best meets their needs within that little pocket of your design. Because once you do so, once you actually start focusing on these individual modules, things get a lot more interesting. Probably none more terrifying, though, than responsive navigation. Because there's a lot of experimentation happening with responsive navs right now, and there's actually no one best practice, which is probably a good thing, right? Because, I mean, I think navigation needs to be kind of idiosyncratic. But there are some patterns popping up out there. For example, 538.com, a beautiful responsive site. And they have those sort of pull-down menus that appear on wider screens to tease the content in each section. But those are seen as just a widescreen-only enhancement. Below that point, they're not critical to the experience, so they just really sort of limit things to the primary navigation alone. Walmart.ca, responsive e-commerce site, launched last year. Um, they basically sort of took this uh, off-canvas navigation approach, right? So by default on widescreens, you know, they have the navigation apparent by def um, you know, to all. But below a certain point, you have to toggle an element to bring the navigation into view from offsides, right? It's like it's waiting in the wings, waiting to be invoked by the user. Editorially, I actually borrowed a similar version of this uh, on a later version of their masthead. So on, regardless of the size of your screen, you can sort of tap on this top left element to bring in additional tasks and information that may not necessarily be critical to you at first view, but then you, know, you sort of bring them in when the user is ready to work with them. So like I said, a lot of patterns, a lot of experimentation happening out there right now. But there, there is actually one sort of common element that I did want to call out, which is specifically the element that you're using in each one of these navigation elements to sort of work with the nav itself, which is colloquially known as the hamburger. Now, the hamburger is actually a, a wonderful little thing. It's very compact, which I think is a lot of its appeal. It's these three simple bars that are easy to work into your design with Unicode or SVG or what have you. But I'm here to suggest today, maybe, that this pattern isn't our best approach. This one particular symbol, in fact, I think we might have a little bit of a hamburger problem, guys. Maybe we need to talk about this. <laughs> 
you know, that just because this is an established pattern out there right now doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one for our work. Because actually this pattern does actually have, this icon has a very real meaning to it, right? It's actually the Chinese trigram for sky or heavens, which seems like a weird arbitrary choice for tap on this thing and we will show you directions to our restaurant. But <laughs> you have a very high opinion of your Yelp reviews, I guess. But um, there's also some suggestion, though, that this symbol might not necessarily be immediately apparent to our audiences, right? Time.com recently did a responsive redesign, and they sort of adopted the ubiquitous hamburger. Um, I miss English sometimes. But anyway, on first view of this responsive site, there's this overlay that appears to explain what this, uh, this icon actually does for you. And if you have a mouse available to you, you can sort of hover it over the site, uh, symbol for a second, and it will also tell you what this icon does. In other words, this is a hamburger that has like seven levels of help text which I didn't work on this redesign. I don't have any data to support this. But this suggests to me from the outside that maybe this symbol didn't test especially well, which is not necessarily an indictment of the hamburger. But if you're going to use some sort of icon or some sort of symbol to actually you know, describe what this functionality is, you know, maybe make sure that it's tested. Otherwise, you might be introducing a single point of failure in your interfaces. But I think there's a larger problem here um, that we need to acknowledge as well. Disney also has a beautiful hamburger. Um, and they make very effective use at it, but actually if you sort of interact with it, and you get below a certain point, and you bring in that off-campus navigation, you're basically going to find every single link that's ever existed on the World Wide Web. <laughs> if you were looking for that Lycos page you designed in 1997, <laughs> I saw it run past. Um, which is basically to suggest that because we have the ability to conceal navigation. I think we need to be very careful that we're not abusing that ability, right? That we're presenting this, this wonderfully immaculate first view of our interfaces, regardless of the size of the screen. But then they tap on that hamburger and they bring in that navigation. They basically show us all the content that we didn't want to deal with in that redesign at all, right? So this is kind of a reminder that we need to be designing for mobile first, regardless of whether we're designing responsibly or not. We need to take these screens that are 80% smaller than what we're accustomed to designing for and make them our foundation. Ask ourselves, you know, those hard questions. Does this actually sort of clutter the mobile experience? If so, you know, maybe we need to have a conversation about the value it has to any of our users rather than simply shunting things off to one side. Because once we do so, I think we open ourselves up to some really new and more exciting options as well. You know, because we should look for these opportunities to be maybe just a little bit lazy and conserve our efforts for some interesting design challenges that might be around the corner because I've been working on a number of them recently for more interactive interfaces, and animation has actually been a big part of my work in recent months in a responsive context. As a quick example, um, you know, here's a circle that I designed recently. Thank you. Um, <laughs> more specifically, this is four circles. Um, and so I've been doing these like, really heavy, interaction-rich, uh, responsive web apps lately that have to work on a variety of devices over a variety of network conditions. And so, you know, even for simple mundane tasks, though, it's actually valuable to spend a little bit of time investing in animation that can maybe, you know, sort of increase a little bit of visual interest. And I hate to use the word fun, but sometimes it's desperately needed. So this is a sort of an anonymized version of an interface that I worked on recently where you select from a list of four items and then you confirm or cancel out of your choice. Now, we spent a considerable amount of time thinking about what this animation scheme could actually be. There was some paper sketching and some lightweight prototyping that happened. But basically, it sort of broke down into this, this three-step process, right? So from a list of four I options, we basically select one, and then it moves into the second position. And then at the same time, we have a confirm and cancel button that appears. And then all, all that basically just sort of happens along a, uh, with some animation sexiness. All the kids are talking about it. But the key thing to remember, though, is that when you're building situations like this, we need to begin not with the animation itself, but actually think about the transaction that we're trying to support. If somebody doesn't have the benefit of animations, or they don't actually see the interface as you and I might, you know, what is it that they're trying to achieve? Are they trying to read content? Are they trying to select from a list of four items? Well, for something like this, the foundation for this transaction, a selection from four items, is really best expressed in terms, not in terms of moving circles around on the page. This is our end goal, and this is our foundation some simple radio buttons with some form buttons basically beneath it to confirm or back out of the choice. So with this foundation in place, what we can then do is actually start to embellish it a little bit, right? We can layer on a little bit more complexity. So for more enhanced browsers, we can basically then hide those radio buttons excessively, set them to occupy as much of their row as they possibly can, and then basically round off all the elements to turn them basically into simple circles. <laughs> 
So now we've moved into something that feels a little bit more like where we're trying to end up. We're not quite there yet, right? We have two separate rows rather than all the whiz-bang movement. But just like the first step with the radio buttons, this is just um, the next, that's the foundation for the step that follows it. So with this in place, what we can then do is basically check to see if the browser can handle animations. Right? We run a short little modernizer style test, and if it passes that test, if it's sufficiently capable, then what we can then do is append a class to the, uh, to the HTML element to basically quarantine some additional styles to uh, you know, then lay the foundation for the next stage of the design. So from these two rows, what we can then do is in certain qualified browsers, move into that single row layout and position the, the bottom row over the top. And then we can use simple transforms and opacity changes to basically take the, uh, the buttons themselves and sort of shrink them down into zero pixel nothing width elements, and so effectively hiding them from view. Now we actually want to reuse that animation for any element that hasn't been selected by the user, which is where the second rule sort of comes into play, which looks a little bit intense, but basically all we're saying is that if our form has a class of selected, hide all the elements that are, don't have a class of checked. In other words, the JavaScript doesn't need to worry about the animation scheme or anything like that. It doesn't move a single element, rather it's just worrying about simple state changes. Has the user made a selection? If so, then it's going to apply a class of selected to that element and also apply a class to the form to signify that there's been some change in the internals. So with that in place, then we can actually fin finally finish this off, right? We can apply some simple transitions and actually apply some transforms to move elements from their default position into that selected place. This looks kind of complicated, but basically all we're saying is that we understand the second element in the, um, in the row of four is our terminal position. And then any other element in that list of four basically needs to move by relative units of 100% along the x-axis, plus or negative. So once that's done, basically all the JavaScript needs to do is apply a selected class when selecting a radio button, and it moves that element into view. And because there's been that state change on the form itself, we can then basically move the buttons into visibility, allowing the user to back into or cancel into or confirm their choice. Now, maybe it's the early hour, um, but I'm seeing a lot of crossed arms in the room um, because I, I, I realize I'm not talking about one interface, but rather three, right? You know, I've started from a very modest foundation into something that looks a little bit more embellished before finally proceeding on to that final stage of the UI. And it feels like maybe the opposite of what I was saying before, right? You know, that I thought you should be looking for opportunities to feel lazy, and why am I doing three times the work? This sucks. But the thing is, is that I, th I think while this seems like a little bit more effort, I think this is an incredibly lazy approach in the long term. Because every well-crafted responsive design needs to be device agnostic by default. And device agnostic means a lot of things to a lot of people. But Trent Walton, who I mentioned earlier, talked about this idea of um, you know, designing for a web that's kind of hostile to design in general. Thinking about browsers as kind of allergic to preserving the quality of our designs by default. And that layout, more than anything, is just the first step in the process. We need to be prepared for that slow, volatile network and build sites that basically perform like cars in extreme heat or on icy roads, that are basically built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. In other words, I think this is something you see basically on any responsive design at scale. You know, the BBC have been doing this for ages where they have all these wonderful UI niceties in place, like expandable menus and images next to secondary stories. But it's also worth noting that this is just one view of their design, because by default, those simple, uh, you know, those expandable menus degrade down into skip links that bring you to the bottom of the page where the menu resides by default. And then those images aren't actually loaded by default on this simpler view of the design. You still have access to the content, but the experience around that is slightly different. And so this is a serious investment in progressive enhancement, right? They have this basic view of their interface that's served to everyone and then conditionally enhanced up for those browsers that can handle it. And the reason they're able to do this is because <clears throat> they load only enough code to see if uh, the browser can handle You know, just cutting the mustard, they call it. You know, so if you support a sufficiently, number, uh, sufficiently high number of modern DOM features, we will then bootstrap the rest of the interface. But by default, you're left with a responsive design that's incredibly fast and also incredibly accessible. This allows them to let go of that need to perfectly control the experience on an almost infinite number of devices and platforms, right? And instead, they can think in terms of broad experience tiers. In other words, I think this is an incredibly lazy approach, and I'd like to applaud them for it, and also maybe invite you guys to sort of look into it as well. There's this one wonderful quote, uh, concept in Buddhism of this thing called the, uh, the beginner's mind, right? Who basically says that, you know, whenever we're presented with a new problem, 
or even if it's a problem that you've encountered before, we should try to disabuse ourselves of any preconceptions, right? We should try to approach that challenge for the first time with the eyes of a child or with the eyes of a beginner. And I think that, you know, this is a wonderful reminder. You know, working on the web every day or even just, you know, being part of a conference like this, you know, we're surrounded by some of the best minds in technology and in design. And I don't know about you guys, but I definitely feel inspired. And I definitely feel like a beginner. So I'd just like to urge you guys to maybe go forth and look for those opportunities to maybe do a little bit less in your responsive designs from time to time. To remember that patterns and frameworks can definitely be a help, but also maybe they're snapshots of the web as we understand it today. And maybe a little bit of laziness is what we need instead. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time.